so Opus Dei at this juncture is when they start getting really involved in the deep state, in the in the international deep state, I should say. But it's run by the CIA, which, in my opinion, the CIA was actually created to manage Operation Gladio. That's my personal take on it. Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel, welcome back to another Opus Dei deep dive video. Or, if it's your first time here, hi, my name is Rebecca. Over the last almost year now, I have been doing deep dive research into the Catholic organization slash cult Opus Dei, their fascinating relationships with global political players, and their questionable and oftentimes unethical treatment of their members. So if that sounds like something that's interesting to you and you're not caught up yet on all of the past videos, you can head over to my channel and I have an entire playlist with all of the videos so you can get all caught up and hey consider subscribing so that you're here for all future deep dive content I don't want to dilly-dally too much on the intro today because we have a lot to get to. This situation literally has it all. It has government intrigue, it has secret societies, it has the mafia, the mob, and it has murder. I don't know what more you could ask for. And it has the added bonus of actually being real and actually happened, and it might still be happening today. So I think you guys are definitely going to want to be here for this. This is an incredibly complex situation. It took me a long time to put together this outline, and we have seven pages to get through, so let's go ahead and get to it. Now, chances are really good, unless you're a history buff who really enjoys obscure world history, you've probably never heard of Operation Gladio before. I certainly never had until a late night deep dive internet rabbit hole led me to it, and I knew that I had hit pay dirt. It has a very interesting cast of characters. We're talking the Vatican, including the Vatican Bank, the IOR, the CIA, who likely helped fund many of the activities that we're going to be discussing, the Italian mafia, and various countries throughout Europe. This is a long, complicated story that incorporates more than one secret society and several financial institutions. I have done my best to compile as much information as possible in order to paint an accurate picture of the events and people surrounding Operation Gladio, but this is by no means the entirety of the situation. This whole story is so complicated and so complex, it took me a long time to get to where I could actually film this video. So if you're interested in this subject, after the video is over, I invite you to go down to the description, check out all of my sources, go out and do your own research as well. It's all out there if you want to find it and it's really, really interesting. But it's a multi-layered and complex story stretching through decades of world history, even up to present day. And in fact, I don't think the fact that so few people know what Operation Gladio is, is an accident. So what is Operation Gladio? Well, picture this. Europe is entering a post-war phase after World War II. Nazi Germany and his allies have been defeated and scattered like rats. Adolf Hitler is, as far as anyone knows anyway, dead. And the Soviet Union is poised to become the next threat to the Western world. Europe does not want to fall victim to another powerful adversary, so a secret plan is hatched. And would it surprise anyone that Opus Dei makes a guest appearance? Now, before we get into Opus Dei's involvement in this whole situation, we need to give quite a bit of background so that you can try to understand the scope of what it is that we're dealing with. It's a lot of information, so sit tight. The word gladio is a derivative of the Italian word gladius, which refers to a type of Roman short sword. Gladio refers to the Italian branch of a top secret NATO stay behind operation, and it is used as an informal name for all the stay behind organizations, which are also sometimes called super NATO. The individual stay behind organizations went by different names though. So different names for the same thing, the same name being applied to different things, with a different name, you're beginning to understand why this could get a little bit complicated. The chief organizers of Gladio were the NATO High Command, the US Defense Department, and the CIA. The extent of the CIA's involvement has been hotly debated, but according to an article published on From Rome, at every organization's annual meetings, CIA officials from the CIA offices of every country would be in attendance. But Operation Gladio did not start out as an operation. It originated as a stay-behind mission following the end of World War II. There were stay-behind units placed in several countries, including France, Austria, Turkey, Greece, Holland, Belgium, Spain, Portugal, Switzerland, etc. Countries that had been neutral throughout the war still had stay-behind units. 
Fears of a Soviet invasion prompted these nations to put safeguards in place in case of an attack. Members of the Stay Behind units were trained in espionage, sabotage, and guerrilla tactics. The units were organized into cells which were ignorant of other cells' locations to protect the plan from ruin. Although there were differences between each nation's gladio operation, the fundamental intention was the same. Paramilitary groups with weapons caches were placed throughout Europe in case of a Soviet invasion or to be mobilized in false flag, aka domestic terrorism missions, which is a far less popular fact of these stay behind units. Gladio was first organized by the Clandestine Committee of the Western Union, CCWU, founded in 1948. After the creation of NATO in 1949, the CCWU was integrated into the Clandestine Planning Committee in 1951. As I said previously, the extent to which the CIA was involved in Gladio has been pretty heavily debated, but do we really think that the United States government was just completely ignorant to, completely in the dark about one of the biggest anti-communist actions following the end of World War II? They wouldn't be very good at their job if they had. At any rate, the popular narrative is that after the end of World War II, the Vatican, the CIA, the ex-Nazis, and the Sicilian-American Mafia created an alliance with the express mission of fighting a cold war against the former Soviet Union and the rising pro-Soviet governments in Europe and the rest of the world. Leftist ideology was a threat to European life and values and had to be stopped at all costs. The author Paul L. Williams coined the term the unholy alliance to refer to this cooperation, and I think that that name is perfect. It's worth noting that while all of this was happening, the U.S. and the Vatican were in the midst of launching Operation Condor in Latin America. One specific example is the Chilean coup to overthrow the government of Salvador Allende, which I already made an entire video about, and if you haven't seen it, I will link it. But we already know the extent to which Opus Dei was involved in all of that, and so it's no surprise that the same can be said of Operation Gladio. Operation Gladio continued for several decades, completely unbeknownst to the general public, until the whole clandestine operation was drug into the light after an event in 1982, namely a murder. On the morning of June 17th, the body of Roberto Calvi was found swinging from London London's Blackfriars Bridge with bricks in his pockets. The circumstances and location of his murder led some to point fingers at the Freemasons. Following this event, the Banco Ambrosiano, Calvi's enormous privately owned bank, collapsed, revealing a huge black hole in the balance sheet amounting to $1.3 billion. Not million, billion. A large portion of this money was located in accounts owned by, you may not be surprised, the Vatican Bank. Here enter the Banda della Magliana, a criminal organization organization in Rome with ties to all the main Italian mafia organizations and the infamous Masonic Lodge Propaganda Do or P2. P2 plotted to overthrow the Italian government and establish a pro-Western regime in Italy. The Banda della Magliana were tied to P2 and the murder of Roberto Calvi in the prosecution following the Banco Ambrosiano and the Vatican Bank scandals. Following the collapse of the Banco Ambrosiano, the Vatican Bank unsurprisingly became involved. John Paul I had declared he would clean up the Vatican Bank, but he died under strange circumstances before that could be accomplished. His successor, the much-loved John Paul II, had a somewhat dubious response to the Vatican Bank scandal, but in my opinion, it's just par for course. He pledged full transparency regarding the bank's links to the Vatican and brought in lay bankers, including German financial expert Hermann Abs, a move that was publicly criticized due to Abs' role as top banker to the Third Reich from 1938 to 1945. There was much argument over who should take responsibility for losses incurred by the old Ambrosiano's offshore companies, and the Holy See eventually agreed to pay out a substantial sum without accepting liability. Those following along in this series may recall that I mentioned Herman Abs once long ago when I talked about Opus Dei's relationship with the Vatican. The Vatican called on Opus Dei to reorganize its finances following the ba Vatican Bank scandal. Now I want to take a pause here and make a correction to something that I had said in that video because since doing all this research, a few things have cleared up for me. In that video, I assumed that the main and only reason that the Vatican asked Opus Dei to come clean house was because of church scandals that the Vatican knew would eventually come to light and dwindling numbers of people at mass, meaning dwindling income. While that may still be partially true, I now understand that the primary reason Opus Dei took over the Vatican's finances was as a response 
response to the massive money laundering scandal that essentially bankrupted the IOR. It's interesting how the story fills itself in as you go and things that I didn't completely understand back then are starting to make a lot more sense to me now. At any rate, Herman Abs was one member of a five-member Opus Dei supervisory board that was formed to carry out the mission of cleaning up the IOR. And although Abs' initial appointment was rescinded due to his unsavory activities during World War II, he was only replaced by Thomas Peitzker, his second at the German bank. Peitzker was likely just as sympathetic to Opus Dei as Abs had been, but he had a far less colorful resume and would not have made Opus Dei look quite as fascist as Abs would have. This is a large part of where the story of Opus Dei, Operation Gladio, and the Vatican come full circle. It's interesting to note that some speculate that Calvi's murder was orchestrated by Opus Dei, who knew about the relationship between Banco and Brogiano and the Vatican Bank. They would have known that by murdering Calvi, the whole thing would have come crashing down, exposing powerful enemies within the Vatican and paving the way for Opus Dei to be in position to enter the Vatican and take control of its finances. Now, whether or not there's any truth to this theory is, of course, up for debate, but the fact remains that Opus Dei got what it wanted and still retains control of the Vatican finances to this day. Regardless of John Paul II's apparent intentions, what has remained clear is that the Vatican likely continues to fund its many interests, particularly in global politics through laundering money, and more than one journalist has come to that conclusion. And something interesting that I have learned throughout all this research and talking to people who do not live in the United States is that people who live in Italy near or in Rome are very well aware of the bad reputation that the Vatican has and the fact that it has been caught many times laundering money. I think Catholics that live in the United States are a little bit more sheltered from that and don't get the same information, but over there it's a well-known fact that people just kind of accept. Now, all of that said, we need to talk about Opus Dei and Propaganda Do P2 because that is where things get really juicy. In 1962, following the election of President Richard Nixon, the strategy of tension began to pick up speed. According to an article in Church and State, National Advisor Henry Kissinger issued orders to Licio Gelli, who we will talk about in a moment, to carry out terror attacks and coup attempts. So this is where Operation Gladio went from being what it was originally intended for to being about something far more sinister. The United States and the Vatican channeled millions of dollars into these operations. Most of the money was raised in questionable ways. The first major attack in Europe took place on December 12, 1969, when a bomb went off in the lobby of a bank in Milan, Italy. 17 people died in the explosion. Within an hour, three bombs exploded in Rome. According to official figures, 14,590 91 acts of violence with a political motivation took place between January 1st, 1969 and December 31st, 1987. In these terror attacks, 491 people died and 1,181 were injured. A large number of terror attacks took place in other European countries from 1965 to 1981. And an excerpt from his book, Their Kingdom Come, Robert Hutchison notes that the relationship between P2 and Opus Dei was primarily financial in origins, which seems to be the case for most of Opus Dei's relationships. Now enter Lucio Gelli, an Italian financier and the founder of P2. He has a very colorful resume, but we will focus on just a few key points here. There are some who believe that Lucio Gelli and the founder of Opus Dei, Jose Maria Escriva, enjoyed a friendship that had been born during Gelli's volunteer service in the Spanish Civil War. There has even been evidence to suggest that the two continued to work together in the rat lines at the end of World War II. The rat lines were a system of escape routes for Nazis and Nazi sympathizers to flee Europe after the war ended. As it turns out, Opus Dei and P2 had a common financial interest, Banco Ambrosiano, in order to continue to push the agenda of subverting internal Italian political life, which had garnered quite a bit of US intelligence attention and support, Gelli needed more funding. And that is where Roberto Calvi and Banco Ambrosiano came in. Calvi began to illegally siphon funds from his bank using the Vatican Bank, the IOR, to launder it. This activity was what resulted in the bankruptcy and collapse of Banco Ambrosiano. P2 was essentially the why and wherefore behind that collapse. P2 was also likely responsible, or at the very least heavily involved, in the kidnapping and later assassination of Italian Prime Minister Aldo Moro. It is likely that this was done under the authorization and approval of the US government, since, as one source points out, four years earlier, in 1974, Moro, who was then Foreign Minister, visited the US, aware 
aware of the popular democratic support the Italian Communist Party was receiving from Italian voters, Moro wished to reach an accommodation with a PCI and offer their leaders cabinet rank in a new centrist ruling party. His Washington visit did not go well. During a meeting with then Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, Moro was told that such a move was viewed in the U.S. as, quote, profoundly dangerous and mistaken. A later meeting with an unnamed intelligence official left Moro fearful for his life. The official told Moro he must abandon any idea to incorporate the communists, quote, or you will pay dearly for it, end quote. The official continued by warning Moro that, quote, groups on the fringes of the official secret services might be brought into operation, end quote, if he didn't modify his position. It was a clear reference to P2 and the Gladio network. And when everything came to a head with the collapse of Banco Ambrosiano, Gelli and a familiar named Jose Mateo were prosecuted and sentenced to 12 years in prison for conspiring with the Vatican and factions in the CIA. But Gelli disappeared on the eve of his imprisonment. And as for Opus Dei and their involvement, Opus Dei was declared a personal prelature by John Paul II, retroactively enacted for the day before Banco Ambrosiano collapsed. This meant that Opus Dei was immunized from the Italian courts. This is a bombshell fact that cannot be overstated. It makes sense if you think about it though. John Paul II and the Vatican owed Opus Dei big because Opus Dei saved their bacon by coming in and cleaning up their finances after the IOR scandal. It would not have been any good for Opus Dei to succumb to litigations and court proceedings. Something else that I want to acknowledge as a point of interest is John Paul II's behavior throughout this whole situation. Honestly, he's deserving of a video focused on his life and involvement in politics just on its own. For a huge chunk of my childhood, John Paul II was Pope and a much loved one at that. However, throughout my deep dive, I've come across information that has painted him in a much different light. And although this is not the video for that topic, I now believe John Paul II was complicit in a fair number of illicit activities, and I no longer see him as the pure holy man that everyone holds him to be. So what does this whole situation tell us? Well, for one thing, and this may be the biggest point, I think it demonstrates the links the nations will go to to keep their perceived enemies unbalanced. That includes violence and domestic terrorism, even inflicted on a nation's own people. Operation Gladio and Operation Condor are just two examples of false flag ops funded and supported by the Vatican, the US government, and NATO. And as for Opus Dei, it strengthens what I already know, which is that the work is invested in some massive long-term goals. They play counter moves upon counter moves anything to put the organization in a better position of power. They are opportunistic and extremely clever, but you probably don't need me to tell you that. So that is Opus Dei and Operation Gladio, an incredibly unholy alliance if I have ever seen one, and one that is deserving of more than just a cursory glance. I hope that you got something from this video. I hope that it encourages you to go out and read up on some of this information for yourself, question things a little bit. That's always the motivation behind me doing these videos is just to get people to think. So I hope that that is accomplished through this video. Thank you so much for making it this far. I know it's a ton of information. You might be feeling a little bit dead so I appreciate that. Consider subscribing to my channel if you haven't already. This isn't the only kind of content that I do but it does take up a fair amount of my time so I appreciate all of the support that you guys give me for this series. It really does mean a lot. Thank you for your correspondence and your kind words and just everything. It, it's awesome. But that is where I'm going to leave it for now. I think my camera is about to die. The battery is not doing so hot, so I'm gonna have to wrap it up. Um, but I hope that I will see you for the next video whenever and wherever that may be. Goodbye.